Well, what we get then is this is Grabowski 2, just like Star Trek 2 or Jaws 2. And we've got to start this off with a little bit of a reprise as to what we've uh, gone for before. So Richard, can you turn that on? The neighborhood we're talking about, as it's constituted today, oh, runs basically from this area around Ottawa Road. It does spill over this way, but from Ottawa Road up to, and this is a tremendously good map, in this area here where Morgana Park is, and it's bordered on the west by the freeway, which is an unnatural border, and bordered somewhat on the eastern side by Broadway Avenue. Uh, most people who live here today find it a neighborhood full of homes, full of people. Uh, the homes being a little bit older, the neighborhood seems settled, seems like it's been here forever. Uh, but you have to look at the beginnings of the neighborhood to understand what it has developed into. Ah, the machine works. The neighborhood originally started out as agricultural territory. It was the township of Newburgh. Uh, my favorite story about Newburgh is the fact that when Cleveland was established in 1796, very few people wanted to settle there. The city was low on the banks of the Cuyahoga River. It was malarial. People got the ague. And they moved away from, New, uh, from Cleveland uh, to the high ground around Newburgh. Basically, in this area around East 93rd Street in Woodhill, that was the ridge line. It was healthy, it was good for farming. And so by 1810, a gazetteer, a guide to place names, described Newburgh as a, or Cleveland actually was described as a small settlement near the village of Newburgh. So it was the dog wagging the tail at that time. One of the reasons people really came here in the first place, besides farming, was occasioned by the fact that the first grist mill in the Cleveland area was started here in 1797, uh, just one year after Moses Cleveland first came to the area. This mill stood at what is now the intersection of Broadway, Turney, and Miles Road. If you look over the Warner Road Bridge, you can see the falls of Mill Creek, which provided the uh, power needed to grind the grain. It was an ideal place for farmers. Uh, you could farm, have your grain ground, and sell it. The area really didn't begin to grow, though, until the 1850s. It was mostly agricultural before the 1850s. And the settlers up to that time were largely Welshmen, Scotsmen, a few Irishmen, and a lot of old settlers from New England. And the Welshmen who came here brought skills in iron making with them. So in the early 1850s, when the Cleveland and Pittsburgh Railroad, which most people know as the Conrail Line now, was completed through the area, it made, made possible the construction of a steel plant or an iron foundry here. The Welsh had the skills, particularly two Welshmen, David and John Jones, to begin the iron plant. The railroad could bring the iron ore in from the docks in Cleveland, about five miles to the northwest, and it could bring the coal up from southern Ohio. So this was Newburgh. This was the beginning of uh, Newburgh's industrial growth. It started in 1856 and grew rapidly. And over the years, for a variety of reasons, the labor force grew and changed. The Welsh and the Scots were eventually joined by Irishmen, who were the people who founded Holy Name Church, and eventually in the 1870s and 1880s by Poles and Bohemians, the nationalities that we know uh, most frequently in this neighborhood today. So that by 1900, when I want to start my new talk, this is the beginning of Jaws 2, if you will, this is what the rolling mills looked like. This was the absolute heart of the neighborhood. It was the reason that people came here. It was the reason that this district prospered. Uh, this shot is taken roughly from the Broadway-Harvard intersection, and it looks into the mill yards. Uh, as I told the group last time, a lot of smoke, dust, and dirt was not considered so much pollution at that time as was considered a sign of prosperity. And when this picture was taken in 1900, most of the workers at the mills were Poles. And most of the Poles who worked at the mills lived down on Fleet Avenue in a district that they had named Warszawa. It was the largest Polish enclave or neighborhood in the city of Cleveland. There were perhaps one or two others at that time. In 1900, there were 8,200 foreign-born Poles in the city. Most of them lived in this area. And up until this time, until 1900, the Polish settlement along Fleet Avenue was a rather isolated settlement. Some people claim that there were only 50 or so people in the settlement that didn't speak Polish. 
And the settlement was geographically isolated. Morgana Ravine or Morgana Run formed a border between the settlement and the Bohemians around 55th and Broadway to the north. Burke Run, which goes past the section on Harvard Avenue where you know the, uh, the old Kroger store stood and the, uh, there was the Uncle Bill's or the uh, Giant Tiger stands now. That was a second ravine that closed the settlement off on the south. And to the west, the Cuyahoga River Valley formed this, uh, another ravine. So we had a natural settlement in the area. But I think what we want to do is take a look at the settlement from 1900 up until the time of the Second World War and see how it changed. See how it changed from a totally Polish neighborhood that was based on Polish customs, uh, from an industrial neighborhood into what it is today, what it began to evolve into in the 1950s. So if we went to Broadway and Harvard around 1905 and looked around, this is what we would see. You'd see the new station for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, obviously, a lot of streetcar traffic at that time. The neighborhood had been linked by the Broadway Newburgh Street Railway in, 18, in the 1870s. A hearse, which I'm, uh, I'd like to think belonged to one of the local undertakers, perhaps the Schlezak Funeral Parlor, probably returning from Calvary Cemetery, which was the main Catholic burying ground in the city, and uh, heading back toward the Warszawa neighborhood. The district around Broadway and Harvard was, for all intents and purposes, strongly Irish, but almost everything else was largely Polish. And the Polish neighborhood's core was around St. Stanislaus Church on East 65th Street, or Todd Avenue, as it was known at that time. And the 8,000 or so Poles in the neighborhood at that time had evolved a strong network of agencies, groups, and organizations that helped them survive in the new country. This group, uh, one of the Polish military units, we really haven't been able to determine which one, probably did several things. They probably dressed up and paraded on Polish holidays, such as Constitution Day, uh, participated in all sorts of local civic festivals, but more than likely they were also a fraternal insurance organization where for the payment of a quarter or so a month one could buy insurance against the illness, vicissitudes, or problems that might strike one while working in the dangerous occupation of the mills. But the church was the absolute center of the neighborhood. And by 1906, St. Stanislaus Church had its own, well, it had had a school ever since it began in that area in 1881. And by 1906, the school had grown to this proportion. And most Poles in the neighborhood tried to see that their sons and daughters were educated in the church school so that the culture, the language, and the religion of their forebearers was preserved in the new country. The schools ran basically through the eighth grade, and for most children after the eighth grade, it was a lifetime of work. A few went on to high school after that. But this was the Polish enclave. Uh, one of the stories I can tell you, and this was told last time, was that in 1901, when a young man from the neighborhood named Leon Sholgosz went out and shot William McKinley, the reporters from the native newspapers flocked to the neighborhood trying to get the story. They couldn't get the story. They didn't speak Polish they had to go back and find an interpreter before they could talk to anyone in the neighborhood and find out anything about Sholgosh. That's how tightly knit and isolated a district this was. But things began to change around the turn of the century. The Poles began to work their way out into the outside community, and the outside community started to have an effect on Warszawa. One of the major events that brought the Poles together and showed them literally to the outside community was the unveiling of the Kosciuszko Monument in 1905 in Wade Park, uh, the, the bastion later to be of the Art Museum and Cleveland's cultural institutions. And this is the order of parade for the unveiling of the Kosciuszko Monument. So when this was unveiled, the people in the city got a better glimpse of the Poles, and the Poles literally had erected a monument outside of their neighborhood inside the general confines of the city. I'll read this to you if you, if you can't catch the wording. The chief march, marshal announces the following as the formation of the parade for May 7th. It's particularly requested that every endeavor be used to be promptly in position at the hour appointed. The parade will move at 1.30 p.m. standard time sharp, and all organizations will be in position no later than 1 p.m. sharp. The line will as follows, case to Euclid. So they're marching 40th Street to Euclid Avenue to Wilson Avenue, that's Euclid to 55th Street, and then 55th Street out toward the Wade Park area. That's quite a march, but it was done. 
Commanders of all organizations will be required to march their respective commands in sections of four in columns at half distance, with their commands well closed upon the force in advance. The staff will report to the Chief Marshal on corner of Case and Euclid Avenues by order of A. Skorupski, F. Mixa, and W. Halter. Uh, it was a military operation, and groups like the one that you just saw participated in it. Stories of the parade indicate that it was over a mile long as the city's poles moved out in force. Other aspects of the community started, of the Polish community started moving out into the general community, and this is one such. This is the, one of the groups that joined together to form the Harmonia Chopin Singing Society. Now, most people who know the singing and cultural societies in the Polish community know them from listening to them within the Polish halls or the Polish neighborhood. Harmonia Chopin was one of the first groups to go out to native Clevelanders and sing Polish songs and perform, uh, give performances that gave native Clevelanders some taste of Polish culture. So this is a trend-setting organization, and this picture was taken well before 1910. Now, the major impact, the major break in the isolation of the city came through political involvement. The Poles, by the turn of the century, knew that if they got a position in government in the city, they could get things that they wanted. And one of the first things they wanted from the city were bridges to cross the ravines that isolated them from the city. And this is a little pamphlet that was issued when the bridge was built on East 65th Street, Todd Street, across Morgana Run to Broadway, which finally gave the Poles direct access to the major street to the city of Cleveland. And some sense of what the Poles wanted can be had by reading a portion of this. And we'll start here. It says, well, we appreciate what has been given this part of the city in the line of improvements. They're only the forerunners of what we need and what this section is entitled to in order to develop this and other territory. That our section of the city has been neglected in the past goes without saying. But in the future, we will make our wants known and insist on getting all the improvements that will add to our good and welfare. Uh, so political involvement then, as much as it is, is much the same as it is now. I suspect many people go to Councilman Kowalski today and complain that this district does not get what it deserves. Certainly, that was a valid statement in 1901. So the polls are moving out. The city is moving in. The neighborhood's isolation is being broken. The absolute break in the area's isolation occurs during World War I. Now, one thing I must explain to you, if you weren't here before, is that before the First World War, the perception of most people in the city of Cleveland, of the Poles in this district, was a perception of those Poles as troublemakers, anarchists, and, uh, if you will, socialists. Uh, the Poles had participated in serious strikes in the 1880s. Sholgosh had gone out and shot McKinley in 1901, and the native Clevelanders had a feeling that all the Poles, anybody with a funny last name with a lot of C's, Z's, and whatnot, was a troublemaker, an anarchist, and Lord knows what else. That all changed in World War I. Suddenly, the Poles became admired. They were patriots. Uh, suddenly, the Americans realized that a Polish state hadn't existed, and one of the reasons it didn't exist was because the Prussians, the Germans, had overrun a portion of it. Well, we were going to war with the Germans, and we hated the Germans, so we came to love the Poles. The Poles became heroes. I, I've said in the paper that it was chic to be Polish during World War I. Uh, this is a group of Poles posed on the steps of the building next door, the Sokopolski Hall in 1917, recruiting Polish volunteers to fight with General Joseph Haller in an all-Polish volunteer force in 1917. Many Poles joined the Polish volunteer army other Poles, I shot this off my wall, you'll have to forgive me. Other Poles joined the American services. This is an honor roll of members of the Alliance of Poles of America who fought in the U.S. services during the First World War, and it's quite extensive. Now, there are about one, two, three, four, five gold stars that indicate people who died during that war. So suddenly the Poles were popular, they were good, they were fighting the bad Germans, and the city came to know and perhaps even love them. But there were two sides to World War I. As much as the Poles gained in the uh, admiration of the city, they also perhaps lost a bit because of the intense Americanization efforts that occurred during that war. You have to remember that most of the people who lived in Cleveland, nearly one-third of the people who lived in Cleveland during the First World War were foreign-born. 
and many of them came from the lands dominated by the Habsburgs and by the German Hohenzollerns, with whom we were at war. Therefore, these people were enemy aliens, and it seemed to the powers that were at that time in the city that it was wise for them, for those foreigners, to be Americanized. And Americanization efforts, which were moderate at first, became intense during the war. This is a poster in six languages, none of which are very readable on the slide, that advocate people or ask people to come to the schools and learn English. They are in English, Italian, I think Hungarian, Czech, Polish, and Yiddish. Now, how bad was it in this neighborhood? It wasn't bad, but for some people, it was kind of troublesome. This is an identity card for a lady named Julia Zielinski, a member of this neighborhood. She was born in that portion of Poland that was occupied by the Germans. Technically, she was a German alien enemy, or a enemy alien. So she had to carry this identity card. And the other side gives a permit for her to conduct business, actually for her to go shopping or pass through the forbidden areas in Cleveland, Ohio, within one half mile radius from American steel and wire, because the plant was engaged in war work, or graze and central armories, which were given over to military purposes. So you could be a, looked upon as a patriotic Pole, but you were still a German enemy alien at this time. But that was the First World War. By the end of the First World War in 1920, there were 36 or 35,000 foreign-born Poles in the city of Cleveland. Many of them in this neighborhood, others in other sections of the city, such as Kantova, uh, around St. John Cantius Parish, or in Poznan on East 79th and Superior. But this was the largest neighborhood. It was a thriving area after the First World War. And that's what we want to look at now. What was the neighborhood like? What was Fleet Broadway like in its heyday? Well, this is a little later than the First World War, but this is Broadway 55th, Dolov, Ham Avenue, Everything rolling together. Let's see if I can get a better focus on that. Around 1930 or so. And if we had the good fortune to get up in an airplane after this and take a look at the neighborhood, we'd get a better view as how well developed it was. This is the remnant of Morgana Ravine. These are the Cleveland Worsted Mills, Broadway and 55th. This is St. Stanislaus Church. This is that whole complex of factories that employed practically everybody here. The Grabler Company, Cleveland Pneumatic Tool, and particularly the American Steel and Wire Plant, the Newburgh Works, were flying south at this time. So this was the underpinning of the neighborhood, this tremendous amount of industry, industry that had first provided jobs for Poles and Bohemians who came to the districts, and then as more Poles and Bohemians became available, more industry and factories came in. It was a cyclical relationship. Good, cheap, hardworking labor was available. More people moved their plants here. But what did it look like on ground level? Well, let's concentrate on the Polish community. By the end of the First World War, the Poles had developed a professional business network in the city that was second to no other ethnic group. This is a meeting, I believe, at the Hollanden Hotel in 1917 of the Polish Chamber of Commerce of Cleveland. Polish businessmen who got together to work for their own good. Uh, somewhere in here, and I can't point him out as a young Leo Schmidt, uh, who many people may know as uh, an officer later of Warsaw Savings and United Savings. But there were businesses all over the city, obviously, with 30-some thousand Poles in the city. You needed them. Are we stuck on one, Rich? And I think some measure of how vibrant the neighborhood was was the fact that it was served by two daily newspapers, one of which was published here. This is the Monitor. that was known as the Monitor Klivlanski. It grew out of the first Polish newspaper established in Cleveland, which was Polonia of Medici. In 1922, that became the Monitor. And it was the organ for this neighborhood where most people learned about what was going on, what was happening, uh, what the social events were. It was published not too far from here, next to what used to be Reliable Olds. It was published from 1922 to 1938. These are the monitor salesmen standing in front of the business. Let's get them to work. Here they are selling the paper to people coming out of a church.
and church was a good place to sell the monitor. Uh, obviously, there were great crowds in front of the church. There, it's a little sharper. So the monitor was one paper serving the neighborhood. The other paper which came into the neighborhood, but which was published on the west side, was something called the Wiedemoszczy Sojene, the Polish Daily News. And whereas the Monitor was a very pro-Catholic newspaper, the Wiedemoszczy had a socialist tinge. Uh, it backed Pilsudski, uh, Marshal Pilsudski, who was the ruler of Poland, who had gained power through a coup. And there were many exciting columns and arguments between the Monitor and the Wiedemoszczy, as one, would, one editor would tell the other one how wrong he was. Uh, the reading of this newspaper is supposed to be very, very exciting. If you read both papers at once to find out what names were being called back and forth. Uh, it's not unique to the Polish community. The Slovenians did the same thing. I should tell you the Slovenian story someday. They're really great. And this was the editor of the, uh, the Wiedemoszczy, Professor Tomasz Szymradzki. Uh, not a resident of this district, but he had a tremendous impact upon all of Polonia and Cleveland. He was educated in Russia, eventually was imprisoned by the Russians for working for Polish independence, came to the United States and established himself as a liberal, free-thinking editor, much to the dismay of anybody who was strongly Roman Catholic. And some idea of the growth in the neighborhood perhaps is given by the construction of a major landmark in the early 1920s. This is groundbreaking for the Alliance of Poles Hall at Broadway and Foreman. You may recognize some of the people. One of the men we talked about extensively last time was this rather jolly fellow, Michael Kniola. We'll hear more about him. But the Alliance of Poles Hall was a tremendous undertaking. It was designed by a Polish architect. That's how strong the city had become. This is a construction photograph before OSHA. <laughs> you can see some of the buildings in the back. The interesting thing about this photograph is it was taken by a fellow named Ben Mahalski, who is now the president of the Alliance of Poles. He was a young amateur photographer at that time. And there were other things bubbling along the street. This is the Halka Singing Society of the Association of Polish Women in the U.S. As I mentioned last time, the early Polish fraternal organizations, such as the Alliance of Poles, did not allow membership to women. So the women went off on their own in Cleveland in 1914 and started their own agency. And this is one of the theatrical singing groups associated with it. You could hear the Harmonia Chopin sing, or you could go hear Halka sing somewhere. And if we looked at businesses, let's talk about other businesses in the neighborhood. And this I'm indebted to Richard Carberry and his crew for finding. The most common businesses were grocery stores and saloons, at least saloons until Prohibition and then after Prohibition. Grocery stores dotted practically every corner. And I think if you walk the streets of this neighborhood, you can see many residential structures now, which were groceries at one time. This is one on East 50th Street. It's actually Czech, Svan does. Now, one of the things the Polish grocers did in the 1920s is band together in an organization called the Polish Progressive Grocers Association, or PGA. It lasted well into the 1960s. The PGA established sort of cooperative buying for all of its member grocers. So there would be one warehouse where goods bought in quantity could be purchased more cheaply by, uh, by the dealers and retailed more cheaply. PGA sponsored contests for the best window displays, they made up rules about where you kept your chickens, uh, whether you kept them out on the sidewalk, in the crates, how clean your store should be. So PGA membership did much to dress up many of the Polish grocery stores in the district. And of course, you could get some real bargains at PGA. And obviously, the last line says, patronize your PGA store. I think the thing that's frightening is not the prices, but the fact that the brands are gone now. Oh, so much for groceries. What other kind of stores could you find or businesses? If you look through the anniversary pamphlets, that you know, Orjex is still here. You can ask my mother that. Um, you can find how the businesses, different types, died in the neighborhood. Obviously, this is good wishes from a councilman in Lorraine, Ohio. But you've got plumbers. Good wishes again. You have the Conrad Furniture Company, which flourished for many years at 71st and Harvard. Spafford Cafe, Walensky's Tavern, 
Jaskowski's funeral home, there were at least four or five funeral homes in the neighborhood by this time. Oshinsky, the watchmaker, and then of course Orzhek's Tavern, which is about the only one of these that's still going. By the way, we found out an interesting thing. Henry Jaskowski's son, American-born, ended up dancing for the Ballet Russe at Monte Carlo in the 1930s. Other businesses? Well, you could still find a good midwife if you were looking. Wholesale milk. And Frank Ratajczyk, a local political power, also ran a coal business on the side. We'll keep going through this, but this one I'm showing you, because if you drive along East 71st Street and that section that connected, the, the area around Sacred Heart Church is known, of course, as Krakowa. It once was a separate section that was separated by that ravine at Ottawa Road. Well, by the 1920s, that ravine had been filled in, and you could go straight along East 71st Street into the Krakowa district. And if you went along it, look at the businesses you could find. The Ambrosiak Brothers, Mrocek's Canfield Gas Station, Clement Drug Company, Schlezak Shoes, these are all on East 71st Street, Pete's Tavern, Krajewski's, Sadowski, which was around for many, many years, and Podolski. These are all East 71st. One street of shops, straight down. Didn't have to go far to buy anything. And that's... And some of the stores, we... Trying to find pictures of hardware stores is hard. So we found one of Scotian Hardware, which was on 70th and Broadway. Again, very close to where we are. And there were hardware stores. I would estimate that even by the early 1950s, there were close to a dozen or so hardware stores in the neighborhood. Uh, from Sebesta's on East 71st Street to several stores down in the Krakowa district to several along Fleet Avenue and Broadway Avenue. And we go back to, uh, to the taverns. Uh, Nighthawk Cafe, which is still around. This is over on the other side of town, on the west side, the Vavo Cafe. If you remember the Falls Tavern on Canal Road. This says something when you're having a tavern on Canal Road advertised in the Polish newspaper in the 1930s. It says that somebody has automobiles and they can drive out Canal Road to go to this tavern. I thought we'd take a look at the Warsaw Tavern, though. And almost all the advertisements for taverns I've seen say, Vino, Vodka, and Pivo. Uh, it's, it's, it's wine, vodka, and beer. And this was started right after the, after the uh, prohibition was ended. Let's do a few more of these before we, we get absolutely inundated by them. But I wanted to show you some of these for a few other things. Uh, Podwoski's, who many people remember. The Polish bakeries in the area were, again, numerous. How many Polish photo studios do you have? Well, there's one that had four branches. Broadway, Fleet Avenue, East 71st Street, and one out in the Poznań district. More bakeries. We'll go through this quickly. But this is from all over. Schmitz on Harvard, Danielczyk on Gertrude. Uh, if you read, this is from the, uh, the uh, old monitor Klevlansky. Most of these ads are taken. If you read them, every once in a while, they have group ads for Polish groceries, for Polish bakeries, or for Polish taverns. They, all, they group them all together. They're really nice to take pictures of. And this I put on for two things. One is because many people still know Mashinsky as a funeral home. But I put it on primarily for this, because if there was ever a pivotal point to Broadway Avenue, now the interesting thing about Broadway Avenue, let's step back a point. Until 1900, Broadway was fairly open, and the businesses and such along it were owned basically by Welsh or Irish or old line Americans. By the 1920s or 30s, a section of Broadway from Morgana almost out to Jones Road was solidly Polish in terms of business organizations, business structures, and so forth. And the pivotal point was a restaurant called Vashovyanka. And Vashovyanka was the place to go 
when visiting Polish dignitaries came to Cleveland, they were taken to Vashovyanka to be wined and dined. When you had a big party or you really wanted to put on the Ritz, you went to Vashovyanka. One of Vashovyanka's guests was this man, Joseph Haller, who was the leader of the Polish forces in the First World War. So when he came to town, he went to Vashovyanka. The Polish ambassador went there. Everybody did. And Richard, I hope you can find a picture of it someday. I dug through all the anniversary pamphlets I could find, and they never illustrated any of their ads. And what could you do on a Saturday night or whenever? Well, you could go hear the Harmonia Chopin. And they were having their recital in the new Alliance of Poles Hall. Soprano and a tenor, obviously. Tickets weren't too bad at that time, at a dollar and a dollar and a half. But if culture really wasn't for you and you wanted something a bit more exciting, you could go almost directly across the street here to the Polonia Theater, and you could see something like Svadba, or you could, in the 1930s, see the Polish strongman do something on the point of vaudeville feats, and it was 50 cents. You, you, couldn't, mi you couldn't miss by going to the Polonia Theater. Or you could go across the street to the Grand Theater, where they ran Polish films once in a while. They ran American films, too. Most of the American films were probably shown at the New Victory Theater on East 71st Street. But there were all sorts of entertainment opportunities in the neighborhood. Now, another aspect of the neighborhood's power, change, and growth was its political clout in the 1930s. Obviously, by the 20s, this is 1920s, and Ben Orlikowski is running for councilman in one of the districts which was set up under the city manager plan. And by the 1920s and 30s, with 30,000 foreign-born Poles in the city, you have to realize that they have a lot of American-born children who can vote. And many of those 30,000 foreign-born Poles may have gotten their citizenship and were voting too. So it was a force to be reckoned with. Year after year, Poles were elected from Ward 14, Orlikowski being one of them. He and his brother were the people who got the streets paved in this city, his brother holding the contract to do the street paving. The real power, though, in this neighborhood, and this, this man, Lewandowski, although he was a councilman, shows how important the Polish vote had become by the 1930s, because Lewandowski was given a point of positions in the city that really were the highest level any Pole had reached in the city at that time. He was the head of the city welfare department, the Cooley Farms and whatnot at that time. Uh, obviously, Mayor Harold Burton, under whom Lewandowski served, needed to keep the polls happy. And what better way to keep Democratic polls happy in voting for a Republican mayor than to keep the councilman in a good position? After he left the office, he was replaced by another Lewandowski. And so if you were running for major city office in Cleveland, it behooved you to advertise in the Polish newspapers. I could have shown you a Burton for mayor ad, but I figured, this, Tom Campbell's not here today, so I can say this. Uh, here's Ray T. Miller, who played football for Notre Dame, who was as Irish as Patty's pig. And if you remember what I said last time, the Poles and the Irish didn't love each other. But here's Ray T. Miller with a uh, Polish case ending to his name, <laughs> hustling for the Polish vote. Uh, you can't see it at the bottom, but his campaign manager in the district is Felix Mataya. Now, the next picture is rather recent. I couldn't find an old picture. Another way to keep the polls happy, get them voting for you, like, and this was in 1936. This is being moved later. But in 1936, the Pulaski Square Cannon was put up. Now, you have to compare this with what happened with the Kosciuszko Monument. The Kosciuszko Monument was bought and paid for by the polls. They had to find the land and get it set up. The polls just simply exerted a little political pressure to get a traffic island at Chester and to get the cannon mounted there as a monument to the other Polish hero of the American Revolution, Kazimierz Pulaski. There it is. It is now on the lakefront, ready to repel any kind of invasion we get from Canada. <laughs> and this is, again, recent, but I put this in to indicate another direction in which the Polish community here exerted some power. Uh, Cardinal Kroll began his career as a parish priest. He was born in the neighborhood, began his career here as a parish priest at Immaculate Heart of Mary, went on to become Archbishop of Philadelphia, and was, was of course, an adjutant bishop in Cleveland before that, and now is a, a Roman Catholic Cardinal. 
I don't think anybody from the city of Cleveland has reached that sort of ecclesiastical pinnacle of power, uh, with the exception of Cardinal Kroll. The neighborhood boy made good. There were things changing, though. And the neighborhood may have looked Polish. You could have shopped at a number of stores, and uh, the salespeople obviously spoke Polish. You could deal with them. But there were changes. And the changes were occurring with the children. They were occurring with where people lived and how they lived. And I think one of the things that shows how the changes were occurring is this set of ads. Of course, you could go to the Polonia and see a Polish play. Of course, what was coming up was Lady Chic next. Or you could go to the Ohio and see old Ironsides. There are options. It's not all Polish. And one of the reasons things are changing come, I think, we'll turn back to our friend Michael Kniola, the travel broker. Michael Kniola made his fortune bringing Poles from Europe to Cleveland. By the 1920s, his business had changed. The main aspect of his business in the 20s and 30s was taking Poles from Cleveland back to Poland on excursions such as this. Why? Because the restrictive immigration laws of 1920 and 1924 virtually cut the movement of Poles to this country, to the city, to this neighborhood, to nothing. The poor and born Pol Polish population of Cleveland was 35,000 in 1920. It only reached 36,000 in 1930, and it slipped every year since then. In the, in the Cleveland city area, 1970, there were only 6,000 foreign-born Poles. That's fewer foreign-born Poles in 1970 than there were here in 1900. So the first generation is passing away. They're being overtaken by their children. And uh, people like Mike Kniola are shifting business. He's a, he's a wise businessman. If you can't bring them here, send them there. And, <laughs> and that's, what, that's what Mike did. And Mike also knew something else was changing. He knew that people didn't want to stay long in a crowded neighborhood that was rather smoky. So he found some new land to sell. And here you are, the new Polish settlement, Garfield Park Heights. Uh, in the 1920s, after, after World War I, between, the 19, between 1920 and 1930, the place to go if you were Polish was to Garfield Heights. You could go there easily because there were streetcar lines there, or many people had cars and they drove there. So here's an advertisement for some of Kniola's share of the action in the Garfield Heights district. You'll love the next ones. Of course, the, the price is great. For a 40 by 120 lot, $450, 10% down and 2% a month. Uh, now this is sort of what Garfield Heights looked at at this time. This is a little further out. This is near Turney and Dunham Road in the 1920s. So this was farmland that was being subdivided and platted. And as I said, one of the ways you could get there was by a car. This is the 1920s. And what do we find advertised in Polish newspapers? But garages, $96 and $146. We have a four-car garage in our lot. We just insured it for $6,000. <laughs> but some Poles were getting garages. And these ads run week after week after week. And the homes here, of course, were built in the horse and buggy era. So if you bought a new car in the 1920s, you needed a garage, and you picked it up this way. Steel mills were going well in the 20s. There was money to be had. You could move out to another Parkdale, which is another Garfield Heights allotment. And this is the cover for the brochure. And I, I hate to give you too many brochures, but this one's so good you can't believe it. It's three cent car fare to get there. And you're certainly not going to go broke buying it. Garfield Park, nature's beauty spot and the people's playground. Boating, baseball, tennis, children's playgrounds, mineral springs, beautiful driveways and band concerts. Values will double within one year. Uh, and that's, you know, everybody says the polls are wise property buyers. And uh, here you go. $350 and up. Uh, lots adjoining ours are $200 to $400 more. <laughs> so there was a movement away from the neighborhood. It didn't depopulate the neighborhood, but it changed it. It spread Polonia in a different form to Garfield Heights. In 1925, there's a new church, St. Peter's and Paul, in Garfield Heights to serve the polls living there. The other thing that's changing, the other thing that's changing are the children. And uh, I don't know how much historic fact I can give you. This is mostly family tradition that you're going to get in the next few minutes. You could go to St. Stanislaus Church uh, and to the school, and you would have a pageant or a safety day. And uh, Polonia lived there, the children dressed up. And everything looked hunky-dory, if you will. 
course, you could go to Washington Park after school and find the local boys smoking cigarettes, having a good time. Uh, this group is all Polish. This fellow is named Grabowski. Uh, he spent his early life down the ravine on the side of Washington Park waiting for fall balls to go over the fence, at which time he'd grab them and run with them. That was how he got a baseball at that time. But what I'm trying to say here, there are two sides to life. There's the Polish cultural side here, and then there's an American side that uh, may be being rambunctious around Garfield Park. I was talking to one member of the community the other week, and he was telling about the gang wars they had when they were kids. Uh, not much has changed. The only thing I think that has changed is in those days when you rolled your own, you rolled them out of Bull Durham. But uh, there, there were gangs, and there were fights, and the children were becoming American. Uh, Polish may have been spoken in school during classes. It may have been spoken at home. But the language of the street, the park, the gully was English. And one of the things that illustrates the change is the fact that by the 1920s and 1930s, this neighborhood was sports crazy. And the sports were American. They were basketball, which tends to be universal, and they were baseball. So you have a St. Stanislaus basketball team. Now, Lord knows Father Koloszewski in the 1880s never would have envisioned somebody playing basketball as St. Stanislaus emblazoned across his chest. Or you had the Immaculate Heart baseball team. Uh, we, we strike again. This is, this is my father, a pitcher at age 19. And baseball literally was a passion. There's some great stories about playing baseball here. Uh, I used to be taken to the ball game when I was a kid. My father would shake his head every time they threw out a new baseball. I said, my god, that's terrible. It's wasteful. He said, we used one ball all season. And he told me all about all the neat tricks that pitchers did. Uh, one, you, you chewed tobacco, so if you spat on the ball, it got a bit darker. And if you were playing at twilight, that really helped you get it past the batter. Uh, one of the tricks, too, is if the ball was fouled from the opposing team into your dugout, you took the ball and beat on it with a baseball bat until it was slightly lopsided, threw it back to the pitcher, and that gave you the ability to do all sorts of neat tricks with it. But baseball was a major passion. Uh, the Alliance of Poles fielded a team. The schools fielded, fielded teams. Some of these teams were semi-professional. Uh, it was all hardball. It was played at Washington Park, Ross Park. Some of them went out to Edgewater Park in, inter, in league tournaments. And uh, it was quite, quite important. And if we talk about sports in the 20s and 30s, then we have to talk about Stella Walsh. And Stella, of course, was born in Poland. Her name was Stella Walishevich. And when she chose to run in the Olympics of 1928 and 1932, she chose to run under the Polish flag. But other aspects of her athletic career were typically American. She coached the basketball team at the Sokol Polski. She's coached the girls' baseball teams. So she was literally working into the American sports world, as well as representing old Polonia. This is the change that's taking place with that second generation. And I think more of the change, I have two pictures here that sort of epitomize things. In the 1920s, the neighborhood got its first social settlement house, uh, university settlement, which was started by the School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Literally, what they needed to do was find a nice immigrant neighborhood in which they could train people as settlement workers. All the other immigrant neighborhoods were taken, believe it or not. This one was wide open. The Poles wouldn't have anything to do with settlements before that. They felt that they didn't need it, so they plopped the university settlement down here. Now, I say that in sort of a pejorative vein, but the settlement was very good. It was very amenable to Polish culture, and it tried to preserve them with programs such as this, which it sponsored at the Alliance of Poles Auditorium. And these are local youth dressed up in Polish costume. But the same settlement could provide you with a chance to jitterbug. So there are two sides, and it's the change that keeps occurring. The major change, though, that occurred in this neighborhood, and one that continues to affect it to this day, was the Depression. And with the Depression came the closing of the Newburgh Steelworks, the Newburgh Works of American Steel and Wire. They were briefly revived during the Second World War, but several years after this picture was taken in 1928, this plant was shut down. Newburgh Steelworks, Newburgh Works were no longer owned by Clevelanders. It was part of the American Steel and Wire Company, which was part of United States Steel. When the Depression hit, United States Steel had to cut back. They had two major plants. They had the Cuyahoga Works. They had Newburgh Works, which were connected by the Newburgh and South Shore Railroad, both of them. 
and they had to make a decision on closing something down. This plant was 70 some years old. It was an old plant, it was time to close it down. So they did, and 4,000 people lost their jobs. This is the beginning of the industrial change of the neighborhood. The oldest and the first plant has succumbed to age and to financial conditions. Not all the Poles who were laid off fared badly, and not all the Polish institutions fared badly. Now, there's a saying, and we have yet to verify this by, by good historical research, that many of the Poles who had saved money during the 20s when business was good split their funds up uh, between the mattress, the Bank of Cleveland, and several other banks, so that if any Polish institution or any financial institution went under, some Poles stood the chance of salvaging at least part of their savings. And many people say that's what saved the neighborhood. So if you were Polish and you had money in the Bank of Cleveland, which is now down the street, part of National City, this was established in 1913. It was a Polish bank begun by Stanley Klonowski. It went through the Depression without a scratch. But if you had your savings and Warsaw savings and loan, you were in trouble. And it wasn't because Warsaw savings and loan was mismanaged. The Warsaw savings and loan, which was started in 1916, was extraordinarily solvent by the beginning of the Depression. However, in the early 30s, the the directors of the Warsaw Savings and Loan became nervous, and they felt that it would perhaps be better for them if they took their assets and put them in a good American bank. They did. They moved everything to Guardian Trust, which closed down in 1933. Now, this picture was taken. This is a Warsaw ad after Warsaw Savings and Loan was reconstituted and rebuilt after the Depression. It became United Savings, which is now part of TransOhio. Now, what happened to many of the Poles? Well, we have one story of a fellow named Jan Barst, who had worked at American Steel and Wire for 27 years, lost his job, his mortgage was foreclosed, and he committed suicide. We don't have many other stories like that. It seems that many people survived the Depression one way or another. My father and many of his friends got on railroad trains and job hopped across the country. He got as far as Needles, California, on the bottom of a train. Eventually, at the end of the Depression years, the WPA came in and provided jobs for many people. Locally, you would end up painting Harvard School, building barricades at Washington Park. You might end up at Forest Hills Park, putting in improvements. You might even end up at the Cultural Gardens, building the new Polish Cultural Garden. So the WPA helped some of the people out of the Depression. And things started picking up. They picked up so well that by 1938, there was another Polish bank started, a Polish savings and loan, Third Federal. Uh, ben Stefanski started this. Most fascinating thing about Third Federal savings and loan is when you look at the people who incorporated it, 20 people who put up money to incorporate the institution, 10 were Polish, 10 weren't. It's half and half. Again, the neighborhood's changing. It's looking more broadly. Growth in assets. I like the current rate of interest, too. I think I'll send that to Washington. But the thing that really pulled the neighborhood out of the Depression, and to my mind, as a historian, the, the one thing that changed a lot of people in the neighborhood was World War II. Now, unlike World War I, where Poles flocked to fight for the Polish banner, World War II was different. General Sikorsky came to the United States in 1939 to recruit Poles to fight for a volunteer Polish force in the Second World War. Not too many people stepped forward. The second generation Poles wanted nothing to do with it. And they chose instead to fight for the American colors. Sikorsky made a few rather bitter remarks before he left the United States, and at that point, I think, lost what, what few friends he had here. There was a large change of thinking on the second generation of the Poles in the 30s, and it was reflected by their flocking to the colors in the 1940s. Let me read you something that was written in 1937, a Dr. Starzynski, who was the national head of the Polish Falcons, came to Cleveland for a convention, and he delivered a speech. And what he said indicates the change that took place in the 20s and 30s. Remembering those old days, one wonders if we will ever be able to restore the old spirit in our ranks. As long as Polish emigrants were coming to America, it was very easy to build and organize. But today, it is different. The American-born youths have different ideas, interests, views, and only a small percentage can be drawn to Polish organizations. I think that says an awful lot at that time. So if we look for Polish pride during the Second World War, it was in pages such as this run by the Alliance of Poles, uh, 
members who were fighting for freedom and democracy, pictures of neighborhood people who had joined the colors. So there's a real change. And one of the things that changed, too, was the attitude of the soldiers who had gone out. They got to travel a lot. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but most of them did. They got to see a lot of people. They got to meet people of different backgrounds, different nationality, organ, uh, origins, and whatnot. And when they did come back to the neighborhood, they came back with a much wider view of the world, uh, a view that wasn't confined by Morgana Ravine or Burke Run or anything else like that. They also came back usually with a good bit of mustering out pay. And they came back to a neighborhood that had really done fairly well during the war with wartime industry. A lot of people had saved money working overtime. They couldn't spend it during the war with all the uh, purchase restrictions and so forth. So the post-World War period was a time to spend. Spend and perhaps move out. We have about three slides left. Richard, I think this is the best slide you've ever provided because this says so much. This is 1946. This babka in a typically old Polish house is looking at a new car, 1946, sitting in the garage. What did you do with the money? As soon as they started building cars again, you bought them. And what could you do with the car? You could move further out. You could buy a new home, a land in a cleaner area, get away from the crowding, the smoke, and so forth. And that's at this point that a large migration from the neighborhood starts to take place. It's in the post-World War years that Garfield Heights fills out beyond Garfield Boulevard where the Polish population and people of Bohemian population moves out even further into Maple Heights. And perhaps the most crucial event for this neighborhood and for Broadway 55th was in 1949, it had a first. It had the first freeway in Cleveland, the Willow Freeway, which allowed you easy access from Broadway all the way out to Brecksville and Independence. And that's what a lot of people use their new cars for, to go out to these areas which were being developed, move away from the smoke, the dirt, and the noise. But there's still a little bit of feistiness and fight and tradition in that in the neighborhood. And I have some slides from 1953 here to sort of wrap things up. This is one of the Alliance of Poles conventions in 1953. The neighborhood hadn't lost its Polish tenor by that time. Certainly there was a good turnout for the parade. And I think when you look at the turnout, you have to know that the Polish vote still counts because the man here is Anthony Celebrezzi. Uh, he's mayor, he knows who elects him. And so he comes out to the neighborhood. That's the last slide, and I, I don't like to treat recent history, but I think you have to look at the other changes that have occurred in the neighborhood since then, and I, I tend to look at the industries and, and what has happened since the Second World War. The uh, rolling mills, the first industry, were a casualty of the Depression and their age. In the 1950s, major, other major industries went. They were casualties both of their age and of the higher cost of labor in the area. One of the attractions here was good, cheap immigrant labor. When the sons and grandsons of the immigrants knew they had rights and wanted more money, the businesses wouldn't stand for it. So what happens is in the late 50s, the Cleveland Worsted Mills refused to bargain, work with the union, and a major plant at Broadway and 55th, the very pivotal point of that neighborhood, closes down. In the late 60s, Grabler's closes down and is replaced by an Uncle Bill's, a liquor store, and a supermarket. The one major plant that really exists here yet, and its tower is sort of symbolic, is Cleveland Pneumatic Tool, and its plant dates from 1918. And I suspect a lot of Cleveland Pneumatic Tool's good fortune has been occasioned by the fact that it builds landing gear for aircraft, which is a boom industry, particularly with the government buying. But there have been changes in the industrial base. There have been changes in the population with it moving away for better jobs or better housing. So Varsava, as I see it now, and one of the problems, as a historian, you really can't tell what's happening until you've had about 100 years' perspective. But I think this neighborhood is going into a third phase. What it is, no one will really know until it fully develops. Its first phase was an agricultural area, farms. Its second phase was an industrial area. And it's slipping from that phase now. What it does in the third phase is something that we still have to reckon with. Uh, it will be interesting, I think, in 50 years or so to look back and see what has happened to this one area of land that was first surveyed in 1796 and which has been lived in by a variety of people and used right now for a variety of purposes. I think, do, Richard, do we have time for questions? With that, I'll get off the soapbox again.